Throughout the history of America, our lives have been punctuated by struggle. One of the most well-known examples of such struggles is the civil rights movement of the 20th century. Popularized by demonstrations, news accounts, and court cases, it is possibly the most public example of our country's battle for equality. Names such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and Malcolm X are mainstays on our media coverage, even though their roles were filled decades ago. However, this documentary will seek to explore the ugly truth behind America's early battle for civil rights by showing the true facts behind one of the deadliest and bloodiest encounters with the South's commitment to white supremacy, the Elaine Race Riots. Southern trees bear strange fruit. During the early 1900s in rural Arkansas, there was a climate of racial, political, and economic tension. While landowners depended on black sharecroppers to produce their crops, many denied a fair wage to these workers. Political parties used the area's history of white supremacy as ammunition, creating a greater divide between races and economic classes. The area itself was largely controlled by a small group of landowners who also used the racial tension to pit poor white sharecroppers against poor black sharecroppers. Public executions by mobs, commonly called lynchings, were still used as a tool to intimidate and punish black men and women outside of the court system. The trouble in Elaine began when local black sharecroppers attempted to join the Progressive Farmers and Household Union of America in 1919. Known as the PFHUA, its members began holding secret meetings in the air to discuss their ideas for organizing, which frightened the local whites. Late on the night of September 29, 1919, members of the PFHUA from Hoopspur, a town that was south of Elaine, covertly gathered at a local church. Even today, there are two versions of this story, the one told by the white residents and the one told by the black residents. According to court transcripts from the original 1919 murder trials, Phillips County Sheriff Charlie Pratt stated that himself, W.A. Adkins, a white security officer of the Mississippi Pacific Railroad, and Kid Collins, a black trustee from the local jail, had coincidentally came upon the church the night of the meeting. However, based upon the later recollection of Kid Collins, the men were sent there to investigate and intimidate the union meeting. Regardless as to the true story of how it began, the next part is slightly clearer. As the three men approached the church, shots were fired, resulting in the death of Adkins and the injury of Pratt. To this day, it is still in extreme dispute as to who fired the first shots. However, local leaders seized upon this encounter stoked the fears of the local white community, claiming that the blacks posed an unacceptable threat. An estimated 500 to 1,000 white people formed the mob that conducted the terrible acts of violence over those next three days in Phillips County, Arkansas, including many whites from neighboring Mississippi. Black men, women, and children began to be forced from their homes, taken to jail, and even murdered with no justification. On October 1st, three telegrams were sent to Arkansas Governor Broff in regards of needing troops to protect the white people of Elaine from the insurrection of blacks. In the meanwhile, frenzy mobs of white citizens continued to do what they felt was justified until the troops arrived. Sworn in an eyewitness account in 1921, H.F. Smitty, one of the white witnesses to the massacre, stated that several hundreds of them began to hunt Negroes and shooting them as they came to them. The blacks that were not killed were arrested. Because the county jail was overfilled, many blacks were illegally sent to local prison concentration camps. Governor Bruff and more than 500 battle-tested troops from Camp Pike arrived by train early the next morning to restore order. The troops set up tents in a lane as they joined the white mobs in the slaughtering of African Americans. According to Michael Dugan, Machine gun crews went out looking for people to gun down, and Sharp Dunaway stated in his 1925 book, What a Preacher Saw Through a Keyhole in Arkansas, that the troops in Elaine committed one murder after another with all the calm deliberation in the world, either too heartless to realize the enormity of their crimes or too drunk on moonshine to give a continental darn. Within the three days the massacre lasted, hundreds of black men, women, and children were killed while only the deaths of five white men occurred. Although the true number of deaths can never be proven due to the passage of time and the lack of official times, estimates claim that at least 200 and up to 800 black people were lynched or shot during this deadly encounter. Many of the citizens denied involvement in the events, while the blacks were arrested and intimidated into remaining silent. Official arrest reports claim that 287 black men and women were detained for their supposed roles in the riots. Of the 287 black citizens arrested, 79 were tried for their supposed roles in the insurrection. The trials were a sideshow as the gallery seats were all taken by white citizens, many of whom participated in the violence mere days before. Mobs of armed white men waited outside of the courthouse. 
The mob made it clear that their form of justice would be served if the court somehow didn't find the men guilty. The lawyers for the black men failed to call witnesses in their defense or allow them to testify, essentially sealing their fates. In the end, the court spent less than 45 minutes to try the cases and the jury less than 8 minutes to find 12 men guilty of murder. To no one's surprise, the jury sentenced them to death. The other 67 defendants quickly realized the futility of fighting the charges and pled guilty to murder in exchange for prison terms. In essence, the court was being used as a system of legalized lynching. After the events of the court cases, the NAACP sought to help the Alien 12 find representation for their appeals. Initially obtaining the services of George W. Murphy, a Little Rock trial attorney, they later decided to hand off the appeals to Scipio Jones when Murphy became ill. Jones, the child of a former slave, had worked his way up to being one of the first black lawyers in the state of Arkansas. However, the idea of Jones serving as the lead attorney for a case of this magnitude was unheard of in 1919. The NAACP had a dilemma. To provide the best option for the release of the Elaine 12 by hiring white attorneys, or to garner attention for their cause by letting a black lawyer be the focal point of the national attention that this case was drawing. In the end, the NAACP chose the latter, thereby placing Scipio Jones into the history books and their organization into the national spotlight. At the onset of the appeals process, Jones and his team were able to catch a lucky break. Six of the Elaine 12 had their verdicts reversed based on the failure of the jury to indicate whether they were guilty of murder in the first or second degree. This technicality allowed this group, known as the Wear Six, to gain the immediate right to a retrial. Upon retrial, their verdicts were upheld, but the Arkansas Supreme Court overturned these verdicts, finding that the lack of black jurors constituted a violation of the 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Act of 1875. The Wear Six were eventually released on June 25, 1923. However, the other six defendants, known as the Moore Six, had no such technicality upon which to gain a retrial. Their appeal was denied by the Arkansas Supreme Court, but the brilliant legal maneuverings of Scipio Jones delayed their executions long enough to obtain a hearing at a federal court. This court again sided with the state, finding that there wasn't a denial of due process, but they also found that there was a probable cause for an appeal. This allowed the Moore Six to have their appeal heard by the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest federal court in America. The Supreme Court did not rule on whether the Moore Six were guilty, but rather on whether or not their rights to due process had been violated by the conditions of the trial. By a 6-2 decision, the court found that their rights had been violated. In his opinion, Justice Oliver Holmes had written that, if the whole case is a mask, that counsel, jury, and judge were swept to the fatal end by an irresistible tide of public passion, and the state courts refused to correct the wrong, then nothing can prevent this court from securing to the petitioners their constitutional rights. The Moore Six were granted new trials, but Scipio Jones seized upon the momentum of the decision to gain a favorable deal. The six men would plead guilty to the charge of second-degree murder, but their sentence would only be five years, which would include the time they had already served. By the end of 1925, all 79 defendants from the original trials had been released from prison. While the Elaine Rice riots may have been one of the bloodiest and deadliest instances of violence in Arkansas history, it was also a turning point in the struggle for civil rights. For the first time ever, the Supreme Court had sided with black defendants in a criminal case. Additionally, this case spurred the Supreme Court to take a stricter review of state criminal trials. From here on, the Supreme Court would work to ensure that the states weren't able to circumvent the Bill of Rights. The exposure helped cement the NAACP's reputation as an advocate for minorities. Whereas the NAACP were only involved in four cases in 1919, the Elaine 12 publicity and outcome led to them being asked for help in 476 cases in 1924. The NAACP became the foremost leader in the civil rights litigation. Scipio Jones gained worldwide fame for his role in securing the release of the Elaine 12 and continued his work to battle racial discrimination over the next 20 years until his death in 1943. The encounters in Elaine may have only lasted three days, but the violent scene left lasting scars on Arkansas and its citizens. To this day, the people of Elaine do not discuss the events of the race riot. Who was responsible for what really happened is still in great dispute between the blacks and the whites in the area. Although it was Arkansas's deadliest encounter between the races, many citizens of Phillips County still feel it is best to keep the past in the past. However, the real healing from this horrific event will not begin until our state begins to explore this tragedy and the truth can be revealed. Southern trees that strange Blood on the leaves